Oh, it's the appreciator again. And uh, I, I'm just going to reminisce a little bit this time, at least to start with, about comic books. Because through my life, these were just so big. Especially Little Brett. Little River. That Little Brett just loved comic books. My older cousins gave me some Superman comics. And I was just fascinated. And there were comics for kids back then because they really were aimed at a much... They were aimed at just first learning to read children as opposed to more complicated storylines and plots and characters and more realistic violence. It was just more like the good guys and the bad guys. And even more so, Comics for Kids. One of the earliest comics I remember reading was one called Sugar and Spike, which basically was about two toddlers, pre-language toddlers, who could talk. They had their own kid language. And uh, there was a little boy named Spike and a little girl named Sugar, and they had a toddler friend who was really smart but still didn't really speak English. Uh, He was Bernie the Brain, and they'd have all these adventures while the adults... It was kind of like Rugrats, I would say, if that's still a thing, or you remember Rugrats. I don't don't think I've heard anything about Rugrats in years, but I don't watch Nickelodeon, which is where they used to appear. Now it's more like Spongebob, I think, but once again, this is like old grandpa reminiscing, so let's stick to my reminiscences. And uh, other comics, like Dennis the Menace had his own comic, and his family would go on vacation different places, and he would wind up separated off and having adventures in Mexico or Hong Kong or France or London. And you got to see at least this very simplistic view of other places, which It was neat as a kid, and the adventures of Sugar and Spike getting off on their own away from the adults and getting into trouble. And the more I think about it, the more I really think Rugrats was very close to that sort of a thing, with the different kids and their personalities, and the parents not understanding what was going on, and the kids making these strange interpretations of what the adults were thinking and vice versa. And all for the sake of, yeah, you got an adventure, there was a little humor, and everything was light. Nobody was dying, or planets weren't being destroyed, and there wasn't a Thanos taking over the world. And the Archie comics, which, while they had teenagers, I don't think real teen... They were for kids to look up and see this idealized version of what they would do when they were teenagers, more so than a representation. I mean, there was a malt shop and all that, and the boy-girl thing, but I think even in the 50s and 40s, it wasn't so innocent and squeaky clean. It, 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 It was a different world. And the more I think about it, the more I'm finding it hard even to relate to it today myself, much less expect anyone else who wasn't there and reminiscing along with me to. But that's part of the magic of being the appreciator. And then, of course, my cousins made these comic books, which my older cousin still has these original comic books that they made among themselves, for their own amusement, of course, but because I would go over there every weekend and spend time as a kid, they were also aimed at me and amusing me. I remember them reading them to me and presenting them, and they were called Mohi Land. And the Mohis sort of looked like they looked like the Minions except they had uh, 
stick sticking out of the top of their head. And they were called Mohis, I am told, because I don't remember this at all, because I must have been, what, three years old when this all went down at the beginning. Uh, I had a favorite toy that was a mop that I called a Mohi. Imagine that. And my Mohi became Dr. Mohi. And Mohi Land was this little tiny world that would be found under a rock. And you'd pick this rock up and down would be like this little lake underwater that had its own sun somehow or some light bulb. I forget the mechanism. I mean, we were all kids. The oldest of us was, what, seven or eight years old at the time? Nine? And they're drawing... The, the comics are so crude, but I would like to see them again. I haven't seen them in years and years, and they're probably stowed away in a closet somewhere. But, but, but let me go on with this Mohi land, because it's, it's a rich memory, because it inspired me so much as a kid, these Mohis, and they were discovered by a teddy bear character named Sammy, and he would take a shrinking pill and go down and visit Mohi land, and there would be all kinds of crazy adventures, like they would go to Mohi's Egypt, and meet the mummy Mohis. There was this whole rich, bizarro sort of culture in Mohi land. And the main character was the great scientist and inventor, Dr. Mohi. But there were all sorts of Mohi, happy looking Mohi who had a big smile all the time. And there were Mohi presidents and Mohi cowboys and Mohi superheroes later on. And I think for several years, they somehow managed to do fairly regular hand-drawn comics, and they would draw them and color them on drawing paper. And again, I would love to see these again after all these years. And I would draw my own comics, crude. Uh, none of mine survived. I, They were much better always disciplined. I was always the one who would lose stuff, use it. Uh, my, They kept all their comic books all neat and in good condition. And I'd use a comic book like in my head you use a comic book. And then when you're done, it's all crumbled up. And they would to try to train me and give me collections hoping that this time... But no, I would just read them and trade them with people and break up the set and draw in them and write in them and trace over them, which, to, thinking back, is a, it's a collector mentality versus uh, somebody who actually uses a product mentality, I suppose. And it would drive them nuts. And to this day, the certain comic books, I, my cousin Richard, the older cousin, gave me this run of Spider-Man because I loved Spider-Man and he felt he was getting old enough that he needed to part with them and hand them down and to somebody who'd appreciate them. And that, well, I kept them fairly good, but there was a, a point where I got bad school grades and the parents took them away and so I couldn't get my hands on them put them in my grandparents' basement next door, where they probably got thrown out by my grandparents cleaning out the basement. Such is life. And that's why old comics are worth so much. They were just so expendable. But it's something that over the years would be, but I gave you those comics and just think what they'd be worth now. And yeah, I, and they would be. It's just remarkable the collectability these things have built up over the years. And, yeah, water under the bridge, so to speak. I think I'd still, if I had comic books, not keep them all special and precious. I could see keeping, if you had the artwork, special and precious. But something that was ubiquitous and all over the place, I just... 
And, you know, that even goes for another element of my childhood in comics and big back in that day. And I think it's still around in some form or another was Mad Magazine. And those were in black and white. And they were a little bit more aimed at grown-ups. But I, I loved them and read them. And there were the paperbacks that reprinted them, and I had those. But again, I read them, I tore them apart, I'd hang pieces on the wall, which, you know, the, the collector mentality and my cousins, that would just horrify them to no end. And then, of course, here, here's where things, thinking back, kind of get weird. Because I couldn't have been more than eight, seven years old when the hippie culture came into being. And there were these underground, what they used to call comics. You know, people like R. Crumb, if you've heard of him or seen the R. Crumb movie. Uh, the Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. All of these comic books that extolled the virtues of this alternate lifestyle of people just casually having sex with demons like the S. Clay Wilson comics, or just having sex. And there was one R. Crumb story in a Zap comic that had the parents uh, teaching their children about sex by having sex with them, which... I think that really warped my brain because I was, when you're a little kid, you're pre-sexual even. And, you know, I saw it as like, oh, this is how grown-ups are and they're just making, just like Mad Magazine, uh, I equated that. So, yeah, maybe I was a little warped by that. I mean, I grew up and I'm here, so it couldn't have been too terrible. But nowadays... Well, I suppose kids have the internet now, and a lot of kids are exposed to stuff that might be even more insidious in a certain way. But that had to be weird. That that thinking back absolutely is weird to think of myself that young. And I was, because I'd spend time with older cousins and aunts and uncles. I was the, the kid always. I was always... When in the family, the young one, uh, for whatever reason, with, you know, parents, aunts and uncles, their age and their life, I was the kid and left with older kids. So exposed to stuff that was over my head, but I somehow in my own head, I'm, I'm psychoanalyzing myself a little bit here, but this is what made me this appreciator that I am with this taste for this bizarre pop culture and this nostalgia for some of the strangest things. Like, and my comics. When I started drawing my own comics, I found that drawing superheroes, number one, required having an eye for anatomy and realism. And those underground comics and the humor comics Things were more stylized and, you know, you could just have a circle for a head and they didn't have to have a head. And when you got to some of the underground comics, they didn't really have to be representational. And I never did sex comics, but I think even in middle school, when I was like 11 or 12, I was doing comics where... You know, people smoked pot and took LSD and went off to hallu because I could draw anything I wanted. The idea of going off into some hallucinogenic world would be easy to draw and fun to make. And of course, what I did was I borrowed those Mohiland characters that we mentioned before, and I made sort of underground Mohiland comics, which thankfully don't exist. I can only imagine the crude and bizarre teddy bears sexualized and the mohis with the bump on their head and what might happen with those and everybody doing... And I didn't do drugs, but I had this idea from these comics and the records that you saw with the psychedelic covers 
and the hippies all having a great time at Woodstock, even though I think in reality the Woodstock Festival was kind of a bummer. I mean, there's all the stories of the brown acid and bad trips and being stuck somewhere with no food in the mud. I don't think any amount of any drug that feels good would be fun for very long. And the music, I don't know. The, it, it's a whole different... And, and I don't mean to be pessimistic about the whole thing, but looking back at my childhood like this, that's just bizarre. That is just totally bizarre. And that's continuing, let's bring ourselves back, so to speak, Gene Shepard style, to the comic books themselves. And I drew my own comics, not the, the dirty ones, but through school, instead of paying attention in class, I would take the school paper, fold it over, so it, you know, a few pages, so it would form some sort of magazine and did just comics that I would show to the other kids, and some of them would think they were cool, and I'd give them away. And unlike the Mohi Lands, I never really kept them or paid attention, and probably did have consistent characters, or and would probably do, like, Batman comics. Uh, that's kind of a vague memory. I remember I had a superhero that I did called Apollo, who because I didn't feel comfortable drawing faces, had this, like, mask that covered his whole face with an A on his forehead. But that's about all I remember about that. And maybe he was inspired by, like, the Jim Starling comics of the early 70s. That, because those were the new superheroes, because they went into outer space. And back then, like, you know, the 60s and 70s, uh, until the Apollo program kind of faded down. That was astronauts and superheroes and outer space and the idea that there were alien cultures as close as Mars and there could be people on the moon. Because I grew up in an era where all those things were actually possible. Can you imagine? It was just... And I developed a taste and a curiosity about the old stuff and would read the old science fiction, where it was just, you know, in the 50s, science fiction was all about that they're very close, they could even be here, much less they're on the moon, and all the different planets actually had some sort of quasi-humanoid beings living there secretly watching and observing us, and kind of afraid of us because we were these savages with weapons. You know what I... It's and all that that innocence and awe and wonder it it doesn't exist now. We're in a world where where is the awe and wonder? I, I mean, there has to be something that kids can look at and get that same feeling. Or is that something that's lost? I mean, now we have these the kids. I don't think, at least according to the numbers and what I read and the fact that comic book stores less and less exist and comic books, they used to be everywhere. You'd go to the drugstore, there would be a rack of comics. The supermarket, there would be a rack of comics. There were magazine stores. In a little dinky town I lived in, there were probably 12 places, 10 places where you could buy comics. And where I lived was a summer resort where people stayed at bungalow colonies. And every bungalow colony had a little shop they called the concession shop. And generally speaking, they would have comic books. This is, you know, when you got sick and you stayed home from school. You're, my parents, you, you, you. Um, my parents are, and family members would come over and they would bring me a pile of comic books because Brett was sick and this is what you do when you lay in bed sick. You didn't even have a TV in your room. So when you were sick, it, if your TV was off limits. I, when I had uh, hepatitis as a kid and was laid up in bed for what to me is remembered as an eternity, 
I, there was no TV. They went out of their way and got me a little radio. I had my record player and my records and comic books. And because I was bored and a kid, they had yeah, books, which I read. And the better, the treat was that they would bring me comic books because they were cheap. I mean, by any stretch of the imagination, comic books are a lot more expensive than they used to be. The inflation rate is mind-boggling. When I was a kid, a comic book was, what, 12 cents? And that means you could get eight comic books for just a dollar. And yeah, a dollar was worth a lot more. But now, one comic book, with the same number of pages of stories, you know, that's your typical, say, Superman comic book, is five bucks now, which is what, eight times five, 40 times the price. Is gasoline 40 times the price? Gasoline was about 50 cents a gallon, and now it's about five bucks a gallon, so it's 10 times the price. So, no, there, there has been an incredible inflation in comics, but of course there's a lot of reasons, you know, business-wise. They don't sell as much, so of course, and publishing and paper, but is there anything out there that's 40 times the price that's like a product? That's interesting, looking at that way. But it, the economics aside, because that's a real... Well, it's part of the whole thing. But uh, back to the comics themselves. I'm not sure at a certain point they became art. I mean, nobody knew who drew them or wrote them at a certain point. That they were just there and somebody wrote and drew them. But nobody fell into that rabbit hole of the comics if somebody was drawing or writing them and went on to something else, they were replaced and the status quo was pretty much maintained and the style was simple enough. I mean, the, the Superman comics... Oh, this tea is so good. The Superman comics, all to the layman's eye, looked like they were drawn by the same guy. Batman, no matter who was drawing him, and it was rarely Bob Kane, but Every Batman strip was signed Bob Kane. There it was. So, hey, you meet Bob Kane, and he drew all those comics. But that's even newspaper strips. That's not how it worked. Um, but how it became art probably has something to do with Andy Warhol and the pop art phenomenon of the 1960s. But uh, you would have to find somebody who knows more than me, because I was a kid at the time and lived through it, but it's really interesting that that now they have art galleries that show Jack Kirby's art. And at the time Jack Kirby was really in his prime, he was just this guy who, yeah, he got a decent salary and he would draw 60, 70 hours a week month in and month out, year in and year out. Then he got a tidy salary, but he did royalties and wealth and even renown. Even though his name was in the credits on the comics, how many people really paid attention to that, I wonder? Because even in the day, I was one of the kids who paid attention and you'd be reading comics with your friends and you'd say, oh, Jack Kirby isn't drawing... Uh, the Fantastic Four anymore. And they'd say, oh, it looks the same to me. And that would be the end of the conversation. And now Jack Kirby is sort of revered as some sort of great artist. And his artwork has hung in fine arts galleries and commands an incredible amount of money. Uh, the first comic book convention that I went to, you could buy an original Jack Kirby artwork for not much more, a page for not much more than a comic book would cost. Now, I'll never own an original Jack Kirby artwork at the amount of money they cost. I don't know if I could ever justify that, even if I had the spending money. And, I don't know, putting that on your wall? That's what I would put on my wall, especially in recent months, 
is changing and shifting still, so we're going to leave that to itself. But comic conventions, which were just a geek fest, are now a part of this whole big pop culture, and the comic books themselves are such a small part of it. Uh, You've got millionaire comic creators who move on into other mediums, like Todd McFarlane to a certain degree, or even better, somebody like Neil Gaiman or Alan Moore, whose works... Alan Moore is a strange man because he is not happy about the way his stuff has been made into films, and he's actually had his name taken off of things. I don't think his name is on the Watchmen movie, for example. But uh, that whole transition has been very odd. And again, that a comic book artist is a big deal. I mean, the, the other form that was similar that comic books grew out of was, of course, the comic strip, which was in the daily newspaper. And because there were all these syndicates and every city had two or three newspapers, the number of comic strips that were done back in the day. Thousands and thousands of them. And only a very, very few became big enough, like Peanuts or... I mean, that's the one that comes to mind. And nowadays, what do we have? Can you really name a comic strip that you feel is big and popular? I really can't. I haven't read a newspaper, picked one up in years, so. And the last time, that they're still printing, even though Charles Schultz died now, what, 20 years ago? They're still printing those peanut strips. And to make them fit the space that they'll allot them in a newspaper, Charlie Brown's head used to be almost a perfect sphere and it's become an oval, they just kind of crush it. And I guess it doesn't make a difference. Do they still... I think they made a Peanuts movie not too long ago. And I know there's still Snoopy. Snoopy is still huge on T-shirts and other medium. But how many of those people read the comic strip ever. It's just a strange form that has evolved in the course of my, yes, this this old PQ River reminiscing here on uh, his podcast into your ears. This, This phenomenon in and of itself. Lately, I'm actually even wondering the purpose of these podcasts besides perhaps like a public diary at best. And that's what this is turning into. The appreciator and in the appreciator showcase, I'm playing things that are all out of some past that is fading fast in a lot of ways. And the people I looked up to and the things... I mean, Elvis Presley was... Everybody in the world knew who Elvis Presley was and his songs and the Beatles who we talked about on the Overnight Scape Central. And these are now things of a bygone era, the good old days. And when I I can experience this modern world, but I always bring it back and try to fit it into the way my brain perceived and absorbed things that were old. And to me, even I'm watching Deep Space Nine, finally, as I've mentioned for the first time, and up to season four now. And to me, because to me in my head, Star Trek was, okay, I watched Star Trek, and Kirk and Spock in the original series when it ran... And then it was exciting when it was in reruns because I didn't remember them all. And then they had the next generation and that was pretty cool. But by the time Deep Space Nine came along, uh, I wasn't watching TV as much and it didn't have that interest. But now I'm enjoying it. It's kind of the soap opera 
so to speak, of this Star Trek, because the characters develop and change through the seasons. But to me, in my head, these are new and they're ancient. I mean, I talk to people every day and interact with people who weren't even born when Deep Space Nine aired. It's an interesting thought that I need to revisit more. And I appreciate your time. I think we have hit our uh, around 30 minute time limit. And thank you for listening to me. Go on. I'm not even sure what happened. This is, this feels different than the other episodes. And again, always curious as to how it's registering with you. You can reach me at kpqr.torc at gmail.com or leave a comment wherever you heard this on YouTube or on the Overnight Scape Underground. But do, if you have some thoughts, uh, I appreciate you taking a minute and telling me, oh, you're just, I don't even know what you're talking about. Cut it out. I like it better when you do this, that, or the other. Because if I'm shouting out into the ether... It may as well be of some use, no? Anyhow, uh, as I say when we part company each time, I exhort you to join me and set the controls for the heart of the fun. <laughs>